High stakes foxing. Paul Childerly and his keepering team have their work cut out, protecting their investment in this season's birds. Three separate kills. That's um, 24 quid. I wipe. Ollie Williams gets competitive when his dad is shooting on the next peg. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, Dad. <laughs> I look under the skin of the various UK government's claims that there are too many deer and what we should do about them. Collectively, solutions are better than problems. Plus, lots of lots. Our fundraising auction site goes live. At last, help us fight Packham's efforts to finish us. This week's competition is from Munchak Trading with its new Mystique dummy training skirt priced at £80. And in field tester, Ryan Charlton has a new scope mount you can move from one gun to another. David covers the news in the new stump. James Marchington brings you the best hunting and shooting videos in hunting YouTube. Welcome from Alabama, for reasons I won't explain, to Field Sports Britain. radio documentary about foxes in the UK, the animals steal livestock. Tell that to any gamekeeper or sheep farmer who deals with the aftermath of that particular crime. At this time of year, young game birds are extremely vulnerable to predation. They're not streetwise, cover crop wise, and certainly not fox wise. Three separate kills. That's um, 24 quid. All over the country, keepers such as Sam are on high alert, protecting birds that have left the relative safety of the pen. Yeah, so here's one of our partridge drives, one of the bigger partridge drives. So we've got mace here, and then we've got a uh, sorghum plot behind you, stretching up around there, which is under some canary grass. So it's something we're trying this year just for the deer, because we have a big problem with deer grazing. They don't like the canary grass because it's so sharp, so we put it in just to uh, give us a little bit of leeway with the deer population on here. So at this point, they're not, they've not been out the pens a long time, so it's quite vital they just settle down into the crops and they sort of learn where their home is. So obviously they're susceptible to foxes, but it's not always the killing, it's the constant disturbance. If we've got a fox working in this area every night, then you'll find the partridges, they just they won't be here, they'll, they'll move off somewhere else, somewhere quieter, and we've got quite a bit of unkeepered ground around us, so they'll go off and they'll just find sanctuary somewhere else. So, Not we've got to be on with the foxes on here. You won't believe it, I see bats. Because of Paul's long-term relationship with Zeiss, he and his team have been given the new range of Zeiss thermal units to test, while helping to prevent thousands of pounds worth of game birds ending up in the jaws of the local foxes. You can actually quantify fox damage by what you find. Especially this year, because the price of birds is so strong this year, and has been last year, it's more imperative for commercial shoots to be on it with fox control. And that's where, that's where better thermal kit, actually it's a better investment. I shoot three more foxes, those foxes might kill one partridge a night, two partridges a night, but, and that's, uh, a, that's a quantifiable saving. Because there is quite a few people now mounting thermals to the roof of their truck, to their T-bars, which would traditionally have lamps on them. Um, again, for those guys, the, the connectivity was smooth, like there, wasn't, there wasn't lagging. Paul, Sam, Fraser and Julian are the ones responsible for keeping these birds safe. They've each been given one of the Zeiss DTI thermal spotter range to use at this critical time. There's the lightweight Zeiss DTI-1, the DTI-3 Gen 2 with long battery life, the 4 with its 2,600 metre range and the customisable DTI-6 that even comes with interchangeable lenses. They've had the kit for nearly a month, so they can feed back to us what they think and how they are using them. On the underkeeper, I help Sam out and I also do buttermilk, which is the other bit of ground we've got, primarily a pheasant shoot, so I run that and then come over here and help Sam out with the uh, pheasant partridge birds over here. So One thing I've really been finding very useful is watching where my birds are actually roosting, so if I'm seeing, seeing them roosting over in another tree somewhere else outside the pen. I wouldn't necessarily see that without the thermal, but I could see 
loads of lot of heat source over there and I think, okay, they're spending more time outside so I can push them more in this way, feed them a slightly different direction, try and pull them back into the pen. Helps me be more aware of where they are. Even though he's never been a keeper, Julian is the most effective fox shooter on Paul's ground. The reason? Patience and thermal field craft. There are lots and lots of coveys of partridge around. So being able to see a covey of partridge, you don't want to walk through them because Sam's not going to be none too happy or Paul's not happy about that. The moment you see a buff of these partridge go up in the air, at this time of year sometimes you do get the deer run through them, but that gives me some idea. And with this, yes, I was able to get to it as it came to me. Couldn't hear them, but it did give you the shot of all these partridge just clouding up into the air. I know something's there, could be a deer, but in this case it was a fox. So, terrific bit of kit, terrific bit of kit. Paul is not just prepared for foxes, he's prepared for poachers. Thermals have given the guys the edge in that particular battle. Whether it's a fox coming in or a poacher coming in, vehicle that's hot, been chasing, and then obviously you've got personnel going across the field. So it's, it's, it's worked well for us. We've caught people with it. They're going to court, coursing deer. So not only are you doing your vermin control, you've got, you know, you've got eyes on, on, the, fourth, on the ground. A fourth with batteries charged and pattern. ground to cover, we prepare to head out to ensure the birds will have an undisturbed night. Paul is using a new setup he has prepared Yay. for long range shooting. The Sacco S20 and 6.5 PRC with the Zeiss LRP scope on top. It's got a bit more grunt than the 6.5 Creedmoor. Bigger case, more powder, more boom. Woo! She kicks up a bit. Still quite flat then? Still flat. It is quite punchy, to be fair. Punchy than you thought. You seem to be reacting to it a bit. Ah, uh, you know, I do like the I do like the um, smaller calibers. They don't kick so much, but I quite like this. You know, a, six, a Creedmoor is actually a very soft round. It's, yep, you know, yep, it's yep, very yep, comfortable yep. round to use. Doesn't have the kick back. So when you're shooting at target, shooting at live quarry, a lot of the time, if you hold steady and look through and concentrate looking through, you can see the reaction on the animal. You can see the bullet go into the target. Whereas this, she she kicks up a bit, she barks a bit. So yeah, you get a bit of recoil. <laughs> not massive, not three seven five standard, but it's it's. You know, you got a bit more recall, and, and it, yeah, you, you lose, you lose your uh, target slightly. So, okay, but potentially a fox later. We've got some ground. Um, we're probably gonna have a look at it just for dark, and um, we're gonna have a bit of a, of a mooch about. With foxes to find, we head out. We hear Julian's already got one, but for us, it doesn't start well. There are foxes about, but nothing Paul can get onto, especially as another member of the team is using the thermal add-on. Then we head to a dairy farm. Stand after stand produces nothing. Sam scans with the DTI-6 and clocks a pair of young foxes. He goes old school and chucks a lamp on them to allow Paul to take the shot. Come on, Sam, you're the... You're the you're no, the... no, to be fair, you've done all right there. you done all right. Thanks, Sam. Got the seal. Am I allowed, yeah. that, am I allowed that again with you? Yeah, just about. <laughs> With this farm just a kilometre away from Sam's cover crop, it's relief all round. For more information about the complete Zeiss DTI thermal range of spotters, go to zeiss.co.uk. Thanks to Paul and his merry men. And if you want to know more about the Zeiss thermal kit they were using, they recorded a round table about it, and there's a link to that below. Now last week we gave away an iZika trail cam, this week it is a Mystique dummy training skirt from Muntjac Trading. It's a remarkable device, it's sold out at the game fair, uh, it's particularly useful for dog training in warm weather, it holds between six and eight dummies. Uh, the easiest way to win it is to watch the Field Sports uh, Extra Show on Tuesday. That's the Field Sports Nation's special Tuesday night show. And you can do that by joining the Field Sports Nation. Link to that below. We need your support more than ever. 6th of November 2023 is our court date with Chris Packham, who is suing us for defamation. Uh, thank you so much to all of you who have helped so far particularly those who've joined as members. We also have a, a donations page, which some of you have used, thank you for that. And the auctions page, which I've been promising for a long time, is finally up and running, and there's a link to that below as well. Among the auction lots we're offering is a day with David. 
full refund available on that if uh, necessary. And here he is, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A move to ban trail hunting in North Yorkshire has been defeated in what's being described as a victory for common sense. Councillors voted against a proposal to outlaw trail hunting on council-owned land. The ruling Conservative group rejected a proposal from Labour councillor Rich Moore. They said hunting delivered a significant and irreplaceable benefit to the local community. The decision has been praised by the Countryside Alliance. We're pleased with that decision. It's a logical decision. It's um, a common sense approach because it's a lawful activity and why should local councils be getting involved in um, sort of making decisions beyond what the government say and the government have said categorically they're not going to make any changes to the Hunting Act so it's not for local councils to police and, and this council has identified that. The National Gamekeepers Organisation says the RSPB needs to deliver facts to back up claims that raptors are being illegally killed or to stop making unfounded accusations. In an article in the Daily Mail, the charity alleges golden eagles and hen harriers are being shot in the hours of darkness by keepers in Scotland using night vision scopes. The RSPB says there are 71 instances of birds wearing satellite tags disappearing. The bird charity admits that most raptors die in their first year. Meanwhile, prosecutions for raptor persecution are at an all-time low, according to the RSPB. The NGO's Tim Weston calls for the RSPB to stop making allegations without providing proof. There is absolutely no evidence with, contained within the article that any wrongdoing has been, been done. And in the British Isles, we're certainly innocent until proven guilty. Now, if a crime has been committed, and, and a crime against raptors has been committed, the NGO and other shooting organisations are completely against that, and that must stop. But to, to have supposition, innuendo, um, and being able to get it into the national press and make an accusation it, it is simply unfair at the point before there's any evidence. Hundreds of businesses in Scotland are urging the Scottish Government not to pursue the proposed wildlife and muirburn licensing bill in its current form. There are almost 400 signatories on a new letter delivered to the Scottish Environment Minister, Gillian Martin. It's signed by people including the Duke of Northumberland, as well as butchers, joiners, a florist, fencing firms, electrician, plumbers, caterers, mechanics and builders. All claim the new Grousemoor licensing bill will cause harm to their businesses and decimate a rural economy worth an estimated £350 million to Scotland. The historic Ockbrook Gun Club in Derby is asking for help to raise funds after thieves made off with equipment. The club, which has around 100 members, lost its tractor, quad bike and lawn mowers in the attack. It fears it may close down if it can't replace the stolen equipment, which is used to run small shoots and events. Club members are also trying to raise funds to pay for improved security after the raid. This is the second time the club has been broken into in recent years. You know, we can't keep replacing five grand's worth of equipment. If it keeps happening, we essentially cause the club to fold. It would be a little heartbreaking for us to be put out of action by actions like this. If you want to help out, Ockbrook has set up a Just Giving page to try and raise £5,000 to replace the stolen kit and install security cameras. One of Prince Harry's charitable organisations has stepped in to buy the largest white rhino herd in captivity. A US charity, African Parks Foundation, has bought the 2,000 southern white rhinos in the platinum rhino herd for sale since the spring. Spiralling security costs forced owner John Hume to sell up. APF plans to release the animals into the wild, even though poaching has wiped out most wild rhinos in recent years. The Duke of Sussex is president of African Parks Foundation. The largest gathering of saltwater anglers ever seen in the UK have taken part in the Orvis Saltwater Fly Fishing Festival. A group of 180 anglers fished the waters around Chichester Harbour in a three-day event. It's a catch and release competition with anglers fishing fly tactics for bass, mullet and other saltwater species. The bass prize was shared between anglers Steve Laws and Ben Worley, who both caught fish measuring 59 centimetres. Matt Fender won the mullet prize with a massive 60 centimetre fish. The multi-species prize was claimed by Lewis Clark. One of Britain's rarest birds has moved a step closer to extinction. 
The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust estimates there are only 300 capercaillie left in Scotland. The figure follows an upbeat RSPB figure of 542, which suggested a slight rise in the birds' numbers. The RSPB is one of the partners from the conservation industry that runs the main Capicali conservation project in Scotland at a cost of many millions in taxpayers and lottery cash. However, the bird charity is ideologically opposed to predator control. It's currently experimenting with diversionary feeding of predators, which involves placing deer carcasses out on open ground during the laying season. The GWCT says the only way to save the bird is to control the predators that eat their eggs and kill chicks. The Great Britain team has won four medals in the first ever Rimfire Precision Rifle World Championships in Italy. Britain was among 19 nations taking part in Perugia with 197 competitors involved in the event. Britain won three bronze medals in the junior, ladies and factory rifle divisions. The men's open team won silver and had two team members placed in the overall top 10. And finally, it seems the Atlantic bluefin tuna is heading inshore. This video is taken by anglers Emma Drysdale and John Trevitt at Start Point in Devon. It shows tuna chasing garfish and mackerel within a few yards of the shoreline, but Emma and John aren't alone. Here's another clip filmed last week by carp angler James Floyd, who saw these bluefin jumping while he was paddling his kayak near Lyme Regis in Dorset. You can see the full length clips on their Facebook pages, links below. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And if you click like below this film on YouTube, David promises to stay bright eyed and bushy tailed. Thank you. Next, Ollie Williams is having a shoot off with his dad. Wow. Yeah. Ollie Williams is having a spot of bother with his neighbouring gun, who wow. keeps dropping partridges at his feet. At Worse still, that neighbouring gun is his father. Dad! I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, Dad. <laughs> the pair are on the legendary Aiken Gall and Moninut driven partridge shoot on the east coast of Scotland, just a short hop from Edinburgh. Well, I'm very excited to be here today. We're at Aikengol uh, Monyut, I think it's pronounced. It's a very Scottish name. Um, but yeah, I've seen amazing things about this shoot over the last three years uh, since uh, John's been running it. Uh, it still feels very strange, September the 2nd, to be getting suited and booted. But yeah, this is obviously on the partridge today. Um, yeah, very excited. We're here uh, this bright and early this morning. I uh, drove up from Cornwall yesterday. I've only shot enough a few what I call exclusively partridge days, so um, it's, it's nice to, to be here uh, actively avoiding the pheasants, obviously which don't come in for a, for a work month, basically a month. Um, but uh, by all accounts, uh, John said he's had a very, very good year so far, and um, other than the fact that the Can-Ams broke down this morning and stuck in a woodland somewhere overheating, we're, uh, yeah, we're raring to go, so very excited. That's isn't that's all right. good. Yeah. There you go, here they come, here they come. I'm coming straight at me, is it going to do something? Yeah. Right through the sun. Just pushes up with you. Yeah. So I'm shooting a Piotti side by side, which is sort of my, my go to gun I've had for years. Um, and I'm using uh, Ely uh, 32 gram fives. So um, they are, uh, you know, I've, I've used them for several years now to, to give them a test under these very testing partridges. Don't miss, Dad. Couldn't possibly use the sun as an excuse, but as you can see, I am wearing sunglasses, which I don't normally wear. So I had one. I'm pleased with my one I had. Um, so yeah, the guns, the gun to my right, I had a couple. Um, but if I was going to use the sun as an excuse, they came off the lip, and you lose them for about a second in the sun, even with sunglasses, and then you've got to pick them up again at about 11 o'clock. Yeah. That would be the excuse that I would never, of course, use. Anyway, so <laughs> moving on to the next drive. <laughs> <laughs> Dad. 
Well, that was uh, some incredible birds presented there. I mean, you can see the topography that we were just in. I mean, it's just dream, dreamland, really. I mean, this ridge here, the bee, bee brought it right around. I mean, I was just saying, the bee really earned their crib here. Um, but yeah, someone was shooting very well in the middle. We were peg one there, so we were slight, slightly on the end of it. But yeah, I still had some very nice birds to shoot that. Again, I won't make the excuse of the sun, but the one real nice one I had flew straight into the sun, so I just literally just guessed. <laughs> and anyway, of course, the outcome was it went on. But yeah, I mean, we're really in some incredible ground here, and did all this serious part of shooting, that's for sure. Very, very impressive. So I'm um, looking forward to the next one, where I'm peg four, so um, hopefully I'll be able to get my eye on a bit, bit, bit more. So. But yeah, so far, the um, cartridge we're using, the VIP game, uh, Elite in 32 gram fives. I mean, some people say there's a bit too much partridge, but when you come and see these birds, trust me, that's what you need. Pretty impressed with them, um, how they're performing on these very testing partridges. Ollie is still struggling to find the lead on these birds, but his dad is bang on form. Oh, dad, hello. Woken up, have you? It was him, both barrels. Well, he's a two good for me at the moment. Sorry, mate, not doing this justice at the moment. You see how high that is. I mean, even ones that drop 50% are still exceptionally good birds. Well, that was a hell of a drive. I'm not sure I did any justice. I shot like an absolute drain. But then again... On to the next drive and the banter continues. Yeah, hey, Dad, this one for you here. <laughs> Bit high for you. Oh, I must have been in front of that. I must. How the hell did I miss that? <laughs> no, this is my drive. I'm starting to warm up now. Ollie is going into the final drive feeling confident. He's near the end of the line with his father on the next peg to his left. James, I hope you'll get in there because look at this. Wow, look at these, look at these. I finally, dare I say it, after four drives, <laughs> found my mark a bit. So I'm, I'm a bit happy. I had a, even though I say to so myself, a quite a nice one over my head. And then I've just seemed to have slightly found my, my lead. And, and that is the biggest battle with these, with these, with these really quite high, extreme partridges is, is finding your lead. Um, which is one thing that I've been struggling with all day. And now we've got, you know, this beautiful environment here we're in, and I've just, I've just managed to get the line, get the lead, and luckily, hopefully, fingers crossed, I can bring a few more down. So, miss it, Dad! <laughs> Die, wipe! <laughs> got there in the end. Die, wipe! Well, that was incredible. Finally, I've managed to find my mark. I actually hit some because I was not shooting very well in the first few drives. But uh, yeah, I mean, they were coming off that, as you saw, they were coming off that, that glen there and just curling over the line. I mean, way up. Sun's out, there's a little bit of wind, but they weren't bothered by the conditions. They were just, and they were coming along the top of there where I was told I could shoot. So, I mean, they were, Obviously quite close to them, but they were, I was told I could shoot up there. And then, uh, yeah, I found my mark on those and then I had a couple of what I call cool, because I really enjoyed one, a couple over my head. Um, annoyingly, my father shot very well next to me, <laughs> to the point where I was mounting, mounting, and literally was caught almost short. 
Okay, yours happened about three times in one flush. Um, but yeah, that was what John and what John's created here is incredible. I mean, Phil was saying, my loader was saying that someone came here last year, fired a slab of cartridges and shot no birds, um, which is remarkable. I mean, I probably never shoot again if that happened to me, but it's just truly a, a magical place to shoot. And yeah, it's, it's certainly in my book earned its reputation as being one of the um, serious high bird shoots in the country. For more about Ely cartridges, go to elyhawklimited.com. You can follow the shoot on Instagram, link below. Thanks, Ollie and crew. Now, over the three days of the Game Fair in July this year, I made sure deer was at the top of the agenda at the Cartagena's Game Fair Theatre. The conservation industry has a figure of two million deer, too many deer. Do we need to shoot them? If the projected population was correct and we take away all the cities, roads and water, then approximately every field you drive past in Scotland there should be seven deer standing in it. And, and facts aren't backing up, so the, the whole, but to, to get public attention you use big numbers, you use dramatic expressions, you talk about climate loss, you talk about trampling, you talk about erosion, and suddenly an iconic mammal becomes public enemy number one. As I said, there's, there's many parts of the country where deer have been very well managed currently with no issues whatsoever. There are hot spots where there are certain species, certain locations causing particular problems with, that we need to get on top of, but deer are not a national problem and it's, it's really trying to find the right solution model for that particular situation. And it's got to be, and as I say, the two, two problem species in England, the fallow and muntjac, and they need different solutions. Your fallow are operating at a landscape scale. We need collaboration between neighbours. We need much better um, cooperation between landowners, stalkers, everybody involved, so there's no place for these large herds of fallow to sort of find sanctuary. My concern is when government comes in, they always come up with sweeping solutions to complex problems. And the idea in Scotland, for example, of having eight or ten per square kilometre maximum, there are some parts of the highlands that that wouldn't be enough to maintain the habitat in good condition. There are other parts that would be too many. It's, it's quite interesting, really. In the last five, eight years, steer stalking, just the increase has been massive. And you'd think there's more people out there with rifles now, more people doing recreational stalking. you think numbers would decrease. But it, in, in fact, it's increased because people are managing the stock they got better stock, they got better deer, they're, they're surviving better, so you've got that more counterproductive. Twins, basically. Yeah, basically counterproductive, and you've got more deer. Um, so maybe people have to maybe cull a bit more. Um, if, I hate to say, if the, if the venison prices would increase, the fallow population would decrease. Fact, because when there's value, there, there's basically people worthwhile going out shooting deer for pocket money and paying for their sport. Some of it is the opportunity to get, get out deer stalking and we're trying to open up opportunities for people to go deer stalking and you know we all need to shoot more deer as well. So it's, it's and part of that is got, we've got to improve the venison market to encourage people to shoot more deer. So is it Mark's fault for not letting people onto his ground? Is, is that what it is? Mark, I mean, what, what are the problems for, for landowners allowing more deer stalking? Are, th are they the block at the moment? Are they the ones saying, we must, we must not let people get deer stalking? No, well, I think that's an interesting question in that uh, uh, as the deer stalking world changes over time, I think there's a lot of legacy within this. Um, you'll often find one farm within a landscape has, a, has one stalker that they've always allowed to stalk their land. And if that individual isn't keeping up with numbers on that patch, then it impacts on everything else around them. Whereas as group stalks come forwards and join farmers together and possibly do a more strategic and uh, a more planned job over the deer stalking within an area, then the, our ability to manage the deer becomes much better. Most of the people I know that are professional deer stalkers will have almost a small army of helpers. In my time with the Forestry Commission, what I tried to start there was embedding with full-time rangers helpers. So you had maybe 10 or 12 helpers, and no matter how good that ranger is, if he's in 12 places at once, 
he's an awful lot more effective. And I, and I, and I think, I, I believe with government, particularly where we are at the moment, that collectively solutions are better than problems. To go back to them and say, we hear you, but we think this is a solution. Before they spend millions of pounds of taxpayers' money charging about the forest at the dead of night with thermals and spotlights, let's look at opportunities where an audience like this can get actively involved in managing deer. Perhaps it would make more sense to support the people processing and selling venison than it would be to put a price tag on the head of an animal for someone out there at night. So you, you do back the science even though it is in some ways science that's being turned against your There's view. a little bit of the Groucho Marx thing at the moment, isn't it? If you don't like my statistics, I have others. <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and I think that it keeps bringing it back to the art of the possible. There's a lot of skilled people sat in front of us here. And we're all part of the human race and this is our home. We don't have a second earth to go to. And what we want to do is care for it, but we need to be able to live on it. And I think the climate is changing, the way the habitats adapt is changing. And I, I totally support what we're saying, let's move forward progressively, but we need to feed our people and we need to try and do the best with the habitats and climate that we can. Thanks all who took part in that. And there is a one hour long podcast version of it available, linked to it below. Next, field tester and Ryan Charlton is talking through the latest scope mount from Tier 1. So this is something new from Tier 1 for 2023. This is the quick detach version of their world famous mono mount. Now, you've got all the benefits of the mono mount. It's made from a single piece, 7000 series aluminium. So it can only be as true as possible. Now, instead of using a torque wrench, you can use the quick detach mounting system. You'll notice the QD mounting system locks halfway. So even if you do snag it, your scope isn't gonna fall off until it goes fully open. And to do that, you need to depress the buttons on there as well. Now, beneath here, this will show you the mechanism of the QD lever. You will notice the clamping force is only going straight across, which means once it's on, it's on. And the clamping force is always gonna be as consistent as possible. The clamps are adjustable to suit your specific Picatinny rail if it falls out of spec of the the mill standards, available in 30 mil up to 40 millimeter tube sizes and everything in between. You've also got an option of having a zero mil or zero MOA cant built into it up to a 20 MOA or six mil cant. As with all tier one products included in the box is everything you need to have it mounted with their no compromise philosophy. Scope levelling wedges included, along with a high quality Torx bit and the recommended Torx settings for the ring caps. The ring caps can be swapped out for a Picatinny accessory rail, which is available as a top mount or at a 45 degree mount, whether you want to mount a red dot, a torch, even a Wilcox Raptor. All the accessories and the mounts are available from your local Highland Outdoor stockist. Thank you, Ryan. Now from Kit to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube with James Martington, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up this week, Predator Control just got personal for Kendall Gray, who's setting a trap for the coyote that killed his dog. Meanwhile, the Deer Meat for Dinner channel is after alligators by boat, using rod and line, which leads to a tremendous battle when they hook a huge one in the dark. Next up, here's a row hunting adventure from Norbert's Hunting. They spot and stalk a buck with a badly damaged front leg. It's all in Romanian, but the subtitles are in English. My Outdoor TV has released a free episode of Wild Boar Fever featuring the legendary Franz Albrecht Otting and Spielberg and his team visiting Spain for a superb driven boar hunt. Back in the UK, Simon Reinhold and Johnny Carter team up with Barbary Shooting School to showcase a new clay competition called Rally Clays. It's a fast moving head to head match with flash clays on a sport trap style layout. We finish this week with three very different fox shooting films. First, this one from Wash Wildfowler who spends a busy couple of nights out with Doug Pocklington. Next, here's a chap who goes by the name 
game of shooter unknown, targeting sheep-killing foxes on a windy night with his 243 caliber Ticker T3. And finally, here's the conclusion to a story from Carl at MFL Outdoors that we featured a couple of weeks back when he shot a couple of foxes but missed the adult vixen. This week he goes back to finish the job. That's it for this week, we've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top 8, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is out 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday, and this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>